reporting here from the United States, and even you know doing more conceptual pieces to help us um, to help give context for how to understand these issues. Um, so we're really really thrilled to have them here. And in um, in in this order, uh, to my immediate right is uh, Christina Larson, who's a global science and environmental environment correspondent at the AP. Um, Christina is a longtime China correspondent, which is where we get to, to know each other, uh, where she was a reporter for Bloomberg and a uh, contributing China correspondent for, for Science Magazine. Uh, Kate O'Keefe in the center, um, who has uh, reporting for the Wall Street Journal and uh, previously covered uh, departments of justice, homeland security, uh, was in Hong Kong for, for a long time. And for those of you who, I hope all of you are uh, subscribers to the Wall Street Journal, You've been seeing Kate's reporting uh, quite frequently, especially looking at this issue of how China is gaining access uh, to some US technologies, how it's making its way over to China, how China is utilizing things like military civil fusion uh, to incorporate and assimilate technologies from, from the outside world. Um, so we're really thrilled to have Kate here. And on the immediate right is comrade Josh Chin, um, who is now doing a, a stint as a fellow at New America and co-writing a book on this big topic of digital, digital surveillance uh, in, in China. Uh, so we're lucky to now have him back from China for a while, and we've taken advantage of that uh, to, to get him over here. Uh, Josh, his work, I think you've, you've been seeing, he did some great on-the-ground reporting from Xinjiang, describing what the surveillance apparatus outside of the detention facilities looks like. We often focus on, rightfully so, what's happening in these euphemistically called re-education facilities, but, but Josh, uh, <coughs> Amy will ask him some questions about that today, what, what life outside of the camps is like. Uh, just in terms of logistics, we're, we're just gonna have maybe 30 to 35 minutes of, of moderated Q&A between uh, ping pong between Amy and myself, and then we'd like to open it up uh, to you all for, for questions and answers. Obviously, these being the primary guests, uh, we're all deeply interested in your own personal opinions, but. Uh, when we ask uh, questions, if you could keep them uh, terse, brief, succinct, concise, um, and in the form of a question, uh, I personally would be greatly uh, appreciative. Um, and so to start it off, uh, I wanted to turn to Christina, um, who really got me thinking about this issue of, of governance. Uh, Christina, you, you've done a really, really great article in the MIT Technology Review uh, in 2018. Uh, everyone should, should read it. It's called who needs democracy when you have data? Uh, and so uh, I wanted to start off by asking you, um, you know, before we get into some of the specifics of the argument of that piece, um, what were you seeing on the ground as you were reporting in terms of how China is using data and technology that, that got you to be thinking about this, this piece to begin with? Um, well, I, uh, I lived in Beijing from 2011 to 2018 as a reporter. And, you know, as in the U.S., you are struck by how fast uh, technology is changing daily life. And I would say at an accelerated pace in China. So, you know, suddenly uh, you're, you go to interview technology companies and the um, facial recognition scans have replaced the lanyards. And then facial recognition scans are popping up at the airport. All your friends start using WeChat Pay, which is the sort of electronic payment system. And where does that data go, from, go to? And Xi Jinping gives one of his uh, annual televised sort of State of the Union addresses and prominently placed on his bookshelf are two books about AI. So just seeing all of these things, I just begin to think, well, wh wh what's happening to all this data? What's, how does it fit together? You know, we see all these little sort of bits of, of, of life changing, but what's the, what's the big plan to the extent that there is one? Um, and so, you know, I think that often we have, we read headlines about things like censorship and human rights abuses, which are obviously really important, but I think of those in a way as sort of collateral damage. They're not the purpose of, of the government's use of technology. I mean, that the government's use of technology um, is, is basically about the goal of maintaining power and social stability. Um, and these are some of the after effects. But to sort of dig into sort of what's the history of this way of thinking how does this eliminate um, what 
what we see and put these pieces together. Of course, it's not like, you know, I'm going to get an interview with Xi Jinping. So I did turn to think tank folks like Samantha Hoffman to help me look at some documents. There's a great historian at Harvard, uh, Julian Gershwitz, who helped me understand a little bit about the thinking of technology and data and governance. And it turns out really since the advent of computers and after World War II, you begin to have people, uh, especially in the US and the Soviet, the Soviet Union, thinking about, well, how do we govern society and how can data and analysis of data, new data sources, lead to different kinds of decision making? We have a lot of science fiction, both utopian and dystopian. There's um, a, a, a one particular short story by Isaac As. Sorry. As well. Thank you. <laughs> um, well, he's basically talking about electronic democracy and the ideas. Well, what if you don't need elections in the United States? What if you can just quiz one person and from that extrapolate what the rest of the country wants? Um, of course, in the Soviet Union, um, you had this idea of cybernetics, um, where basically the idea was, well, we don't want open markets, but can we use other kinds of data sources to um, enhance a command and control economy to evaluate you know, when you need higher prices for baseball bats, and when you need more rice in Siberia, or such things. Um, and you know, from the, really from the 1980s, when the personal computers, you know, not many people had them, but, it, but they began to be developed, and it was clear that was going to spread, you saw Chinese leaders grappling with the question of, wow, there's going to be a whole lot more data available about people's daily lives, and that would be something um, that could be useful. And I think that whereas in the Soviet Union, this idea of gathering data was to substitute for open markets, in China it took more the form of why don't we, what, can we use data to substitute for um, uh, other kinds of external feedback, you know, elections, free press, other ways that you figure out what's going on in the country. Because I, I don't need to remind anyone in this room, but China has 1.4 billion people. It's a huge and complex country. And it's always been a question of how does the leader, whether it's an emperor or now uh, the Communist Party, how does anybody in Beijing know what's happening in all the different parts of the, of the country and make decisions? And so um, that's really sort of the thread that I was, I was tracing. You know, in the piece, one of the things I found interesting is um, there has been a, a, a shift of sort um, between the leadership, just immediate leadership of Hu Jintao and Xi Jinping. Can you just talk a little bit about, I think we all know very much about the, the level of control that's being instituted about Xi Jinping, but could you give us a, just even within a 10-year period, there's been a, 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 a shift in vision a little bit between some limited experimentations in, in a more open civil society and democratization versus today. Just compare and contrast a little bit what we were seeing 10 years ago in terms of what the party was, was trying to do in, to, to measure public sentiment and, and now maybe just paint a little bit of the vision today. So China, of course, is a one-party state, but um, there are um, discrepancies uh, and rivalries between different levels of governments. Um, and also between different factions within the government. So I did a lot of environmental reporting. So let's say that you often would have the environmental ministry um, you sort of pitted against the priorities of the, um, the National uh, Reform and Development Commission, for example. Um, and so basically, um, again, I'm sure you know, but you know, Deng Xiaoping has devolved quite a lot of power to the provinces. There was always data issues, but as, as um, more decision-making and autonomy was located um, in the provinces, the question of how, what information does the center get and how good is that information became more pronounced. And you saw that especially, again, on the environmental front with pollution. So the government passes all these, you know, strict-sounding pollution controls, and yet the skies aren't getting any less gray. So um, what's, what's, what's happening there? Why, why are these... Why are these it intended policies not actually uh, happening or taking place. So um, whether it was fully intentional or it was just in effect uh, happening sort of by default, when I came to China in 2011, there was a, a greater openness for people outside of government to get information and publicize information about when things were going wrong on a local level, especially if 
they were going in and wrong in a way that was contrary to what seemed to be the intentions of Beijing. So that was the era in which Global Times, which of course we all know is a nationalist, uh, effectively tabloid, they were actually doing some really good anti-corruption reporting, um, outing um, different officials who uh, you know, had sort of payola schemes, which was quite, um, I thought, you know, in retrospect, seems quite surprising that that was allowed to exist. Of course, um, I reported on NGOs that were going and looking at pollution data um, in, in the provinces and you know, outing factories that were doing things like dumping sludge in the middle of the night that they weren't supposed to into the Yellow River. Um, and of course, 2011 was also the heyday of Weibo, which was the um, online Twitter-like platform that you know people were calling it was like a public square, you know, a digital public square in China. And you had citizen sort of vigilantes outing officials like quote Brother Watch, some guy who had a lot of uh, Rolexes in his basement that his civil servant salary didn't explain. So what, what were the bribes, what was the, what was the way that that money was coming to him? So that period, um, in retrospect, was th there, there were more avenues. Again, I think it was partly intentional. Like, uh, obviously, Global Times is a state-run newspaper, and, and it's, I'm just using that as one example. Um, and, you know, I think with Weixin, uh, or, sorry, with Weibo, you know, the government really hadn't figured out what its policy was going to be. But there was more openness for people who were outside the system, strictly speaking, to give input on what was happening. Um, and then, you know, w when did that begin to change? That, that could be an argument that we talk about for a year and many people write theses about. But, you know, I mean, I think one potential turning point is um, the government paying attention to what was happening with the Arab Spring and being worried that this kind of openness, especially digital openness, could become a threat. And certainly when, when she came to power in 2012, he immediately started talking about cyber sovereignty and this idea that, that China needed to assert control strongly over the domestic internet. And since then, I think we've seen a, a con pretty continuous decrease in the space for NGOs, media, people you know, online to critique or give negative information about, um, about government priorities and execution. Meanwhile, of course, you've had the explosion of people using the internet, the mobile internet, and giving, effectively giving data about their location. I mean, obviously, a smartphone is you're traveling around with a geolocator all the time. Um, every time you make a transaction on WeChat Pay, you know, a company which can't say no if the government asks for that data, but a company is collecting minute information about all of your, your transactions. So um, I think the availability of data, the fear of the digital space getting out of hand, um, and you know, probably personality and other things contributed to um, a shift away from outside input and a shift toward let's, uh, let's continue to gather tons of information about the country and about what people are doing, but um, in a, a more data-driven as opposed to sort of, I guess, sort of independent-driven way. You know, just final question on this is, um, we talked about this before, that there's this narrative right now in the United States, at least, that uh, a, a significant scale uh, uh, um, advantage China has is just the amount of data that it's able to, to collect and that this gives it huge advantages in, in say, frontier technologies like AI. Um, and even just to the core problem, you know, you, you'd, in your piece you quoted uh, a friend of ours, Debbie Seligson, you know, who talked about this, this problem of what you just outlined of for authoritarian political systems without democratic institutions and a free press and polling, which essentially give you a, a more granular idea uh, of what the population is thinking, that they were turning to sort of data accumulation and that the, the quantity of data was going to give them uh, insights into this. You've argued that actually they're just looking at the, the uh, amount of data you're collecting uh, misses the idea of the quality of the data you're collecting and the limitations uh, of that data. Can you talk a little bit about why it may not be as huge an advantage as some of us think for China to have, have access to a gargantuan pile of data. Right. 
So just to separate out one thing, so I'm just going to focus on the governance issue. Obviously, the development of technology, we've got the civil military question, which Katie might address, um, and the development of new industries, which I can talk about. But I think just to sort of continue sort of our, our, our strain, to talk about the governance issue. Um, there's always, I think, uh, a fallacy that that technology is it's always oversold, right? I mean, almost always. Um, that we we assume that it can do more um, than than it actually can. And to just have a domestic example um, for Washington, I mean, looking at all the polling data in 2016, right? I mean, Hillary Clinton was a shoe in to win the Electoral College and the presidency. And that didn't happen, despite all the data that had been collected, including some newfangled AI analysis of that data. So, um, you know, data, uh, data is, is a useful tool, but I don't think it's a, a be-all and end-all. Just a couple other sort of specific examples. Um, you know, uh, for example, in China, um, there, there's been testing and I, I believe deployment of um, police algorithms to forecast who might commit future criminal activity based on different kinds of data gathered. And there, I should say there have been experiments with this in the United States as well. Now, I can speak more about what's happening in the U.S., because, but it's, it's, it's a data question because basically you have more access to like what the control set data is and what actually happened. All of that is sort of hidden in China, so it's very difficult to evaluate the effectiveness. But in the US, you, you might not be surprised to know that police algorithms that take into, take into uh, the data set things like past rates of incarceration have a tendency to predict that African Americans are more likely to commit crimes. And if we want to have a China context, let's say Uyghurs. Now, is that because these people are more likely to commit crimes? Or is this because they are the victims of systematic racism or discrimination that makes them more likely to be locked up? Do you see? So there's no pure data set. The data that you feed into something, the way you design the algorithms, shapes what will come out of it. There was also a study in either Science or Nature just two weeks ago about commercially deployed healthcare algorithms in the United States that found that they did a better job of predicting treatment plans for white men than for any other group, probably because more of the data that they've been using is drawn for white men than for any other group. So the idea that because something is an algorithm and it, rely, and it has a lot of data behind it, that it's more right or truthful than another system of evaluation is just, it's, it's not true. And the reason that I can tell you about the biases with these US examples, again, is, is because we have access to the data behind things. I don't have access to the data behind policing algorithms used in Xinjiang. I mean, Crime rates are one of these um, stats in China that almost everybody thinks are deeply, deeply underreported. But I couldn't tell you since the deployment of X policy, the crime rate has gone up or down because we don't even know what the crime rate is to begin with, let alone what it is afterwards. So my caution in terms of governance, especially in China, but anywhere, is you know that data and algorithms are fallible. Yeah, great point. Uh, and good segue, actually, to, to Amy, I think, who's going to talk to Josh about Xinjiang. Yeah, well, thank you, first of all, for those comments, because I think it is really important to remember that technology, all that glitters, is not gold. Um, and if you put bad data into an algorithm, you get bad data out, um, or bias data. Um, Josh, you did some really great reporting that was groundbreaking on how technology was being used in Xinjiang. I uh, really... I think was some of the first reporting on that and to help people understand what was going on. Uh, in one of your pieces, I want to quote this right, you quoted a Chinese human rights lawyer who said that the CCP constantly takes lessons from the high pressure rule they apply in Xinjiang and, and implement them in the East. So what happens in Xinjiang has a bearing on the fate of all Chinese people. Can you talk, and obviously we often do focus on the detention facilities there, the extrajudicial det detention facilities, but right. the entire area is being governed using a lot of 
emerging technologies. Can you talk about the situation in Xinjiang kind of more generally, and then also what does that mean for the rest of China? Right. Um, so thank you. Uh, thanks everyone for coming. Um, so yeah, in, in uh, a little bit of background, uh, we started uh, at the Wall Street Journal uh, reporting on, on what was going on in Xinjiang in sort of uh, the fall of 2017, and that's sort of that was a few months after after the the, the crackdown, this current crackdown in Xinjiang, had really started to gain steam. Uh, so the so the camps were were sort of being built towards the end of. Uh, 2016 and into 2017, and they really started rounding people up a lot in May that year. Um, but then, then, then kind of continued to do it throughout the rest of the, the year, and are still obviously still doing doing that. Um, so, I mean, just to give you a but, but like like you said, the camps are only sort of part of the story. Um, and, uh, and so, we wanted to concentrate on what was actually happening at, at sort of street level for people in their daily lives. And uh, to give you a little bit of context, you can sort of get an idea from the numbers of, of, of how much of the surveillance is actually outside of the camps and the control is outside of the camps. So in 2017, which I believe is the last year we have solid numbers uh, for, the Xinjiang government spent around, somewhere around uh, 9 billion US dollars on domestic security. And the Jamestown Foundation calculated last year that around roughly three billion of that was spent on uh, on facilities, security facilities, which which they assume, I think, reasonably were were the were internment camps. So that leaves a whole six billion dollars left spent on other things. And basically, what that breaks down to, if you look at the budget numbers and uh, um, the research has been done, is is uh, both personnel and the split between personnel and, and security personnel and surveillance technology. Um, and so, and if you go to Xinjiang, I mean, it's, it's anyone who's, who, who goes there now is, I mean, almost everyone comes away with the same sort of sense of shock. I mean, it, it, it really, I mean, including Chinese uh, colleagues of mine who were initially skeptical of our reporting, uh, it just seemed so incredible that they didn't believe it. And, you know, um, then went out there and came back and were like, yeah, it's, it's, actually, it's actually worse than what, than what you said. But what, what you notice when you go there is it feels like a sort of high tech, um, like occupied territory, right? So there are, you immediately see uh, on the streets, there are huge numbers of police, even more, Xinjiang has always had a large number of police and, 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 and armed police, paramilitary troops, but it, it's vastly more. And then in addition to that, you see sort of the immediate thing you notice are kind of cameras everywhere. Um, and then also security checkpoints, right? Um, and so, like any time, anywhere you want to go, uh, you have if it's, it's a hotel or a bank, uh, a, a, a bazaar, any you know, obviously airports, bus stations, almost any public place, you have to pass through a security gate. Uh, and increasingly, they're sort of high tech. They're not, you know, they they have like a a scanner for your ID card, and you scan your ID card, uh, and then there's a camera that matches your ID card information with your face to, to, uh, to verify that it's you, and of course they can use this information to sort of track where you go, uh, and, you, and you really can't go anywhere without bringing your, your ID card these days. Um, and so those are the immediate things. I mean, when we, when we first, we went in and we uh, went with a colleague and we drove in and we probably, you know, on the high, there are also highway checkpoints, and I think on our first day we went, we calculated, we went through seven or eight different checkpoints just to kind of get to our first location. Um, but then, you know, beyond that you have um, all sorts of other sort of less obvious sort of technology. So you have in, in the cameras there's facial recognition technology, which I think by now most people here are, f are familiar with. This, um, there's also, they're developing things like gate recognition technology. So facial recognition, the, the, the good thing about facial recognition technology uh, as Christina indicated, it's not quite what it's, you know, like, like all technology, it's not quite what it's cracked up to be yet anyway. So you actually have to be quite close to someone. You have to have pretty good lighting to really get a good read on someone. But with something like gate recognition technology, you know, people, the, the way people walk is relatively unique. It's not fingerprint unique, but it's pretty, pretty good. And so you can be identified at a distance, right? And if, and if you combine things like facial recognition with gate recognition, uh, they also have voice recognition. So it's kind of this, I mean, outside, especially in public, it's like this, it's a pretty total, uh, total coverage, in, in, at least in the cities, in places like Arumshi and Kashgar. And the effect of this is, I mean, it can be, I mean, people react to this in different ways. So we, um, 
one of the people we interviewed on our first trip was, was a, this guy named Parhat, who was a, a fruit vendor, uh, who um, had had um, you know, pretty, I mean, pretty, pretty poor guy, lived in kind of one of the slum areas of, of, of Urumqi. Uh, he'd had some run-ins with the police after the, there were these ethnic riots in Urumqi in, in 2009 that, that really sort of changed the entire complexion of, 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 of Xinjiang. And, um, and he, had, he had actually not been there, but he had been sort of, the police had come around afterwards and were shutting down like stores and he owned a shop and he had like tried to stop them from like confiscating his goods and been beaten and thrown in jail. So he had a, he had a criminal record from that. Um, but he, so he know we were, talk, we were asking him about you know, what, you know, what's going on with this surveillance, and he's like, oh, he's like, well, you know, every time I go anywhere, whenever I scan my ID card, an alarm goes off. And then we're like, oh, well, why is that? He's like, I don't know. But he's like, the only thing I notice, I know is that like when I, uh, you know, a few weeks before, a couple of days before this started happening, I was called in because I had some overdue phones, some very badly overdue mobile phone bills. Um, and when I went in there, like this woman pulled up my name and there was like a big like red X across my face in the computer system and she showed it to me and she asked me what I'd done wrong and I had no idea. And then ever since then my ID card has set off alarms. And what we found out later uh, through Human Rights Watch is that this is um, unpaid mobile phone bills is in the system of, in, in the algorithmic system that they have set up in Xinjiang is one of the data points that suggests someone is dangerous, right? Mm. That someone is a threat to society. Um, and so, and it just kind of drove him crazy, right? I mean, he was, he was, he had been recently remarried, his wife lived in, his wife's family lived in Hotan in, in southern Xinjiang, he had never been able to visit them because he couldn't leave, he was afraid to leave his neighborhood because he thought the police would pick him up. Um, and it was just, you could see, it was, he was like, he was kind of seething with anger, uh, very, very upset. Um, and he was so upset that he allowed us to shoot an interview with him on camera, which was, which was, ended up being a little bit controversial with some people, but, but we, you know, we had sort of asked him several times, are you sure you want to do this? And he was, and we're, you know, we kind of laid it all out. You can go back to jail all this sort of stuff. And he said he was so angry that he, he allowed us to, to film and name him. Um, there's other people who react differently. They're just much more afraid. And I think that's the, the more common reaction is just, is just this sort of debilitating fear. Um, and people really don't, um, you know, they sort of imagine that the government could see probably more than they can. Again, this gets to, you know, Surveillance doesn't necessarily, and data collection doesn't necessarily work the way it says, that the government says it does, or companies say it does, but the perception that it works that well is, is all you really need in some cases. And so and a lot of Uyghurs just, um, they, they assume that they're kind of under constant surveillance, even in their own homes. And it's a, it has a really, uh, a really um, kind of brutal effect on their, on their psychology. Um, and you're starting to, so you are starting to see this now in, in Beijing. I mean, the, the, the quote from the, the human rights activist is, is starting to turn true, right? So if you go, if you're in Beijing now, um, especially in the last year, it's been a, it's astounding. Shanghai as well, I was just down there recently. It, it, the number of cameras on the streets is really, really, um, uh, it's just exploded. Um, and then you also have the same thing with, with the security people. Uh, there's a sort of much heavier security presence on the streets. There, there are, Rumors of, oh, I forgot to mention, there's cell phone checks in Xinjiang, so they have like random, they'll grab your phone and they have like these little handheld devices that they can plug in. Uh, I think it's just Android for now, so if you go to Xinjiang, <laughs> take an iPhone. But, um, but uh, they can plug in an Android devo uh, device and immediately scan, scan uh, everything that's on there. Um, so they're starting, there are rumors that this is happening now outside of China. It's been hard to really pin down whether that's actually happening. Outside, but, of, out of, outside oh, sorry, of Xinjiang? Outside of Xinjiang. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, and uh, yeah, so it is starting to creep, creep outside, of the, outside of the borders of Xinjiang. Interesting. And so do we know where the technology is coming from? How is the government procuring it? Is there any transparency? Right. Are these Chinese companies? Like where, where, how is right. this being developed? So, um, so a lot of it is, I mean, a lot of this is homegrown. Um, in the sense of the actual algorithms, the technology. China has, has been um, a, has, has proven itself very adept. The Chinese, Chinese companies have proven themselves very adept at developing these sorts of technologies. Um, and, that, and Chinese researchers have been involved in developing this sort of computer vision related, uh, surveillance related technologies uh, from, from a very early stage, including in the US. 
Um, and so, so a lot of the, the technology is coming, it's coming from Chinese companies being developed by Chinese companies. Of course, you know, there is with technology, there's always a huge amount of back and forth uh, between the US and China in terms of research, right? So, you know, I think you, would, you couldn't argue that these are 100% um, uh, natively developed technologies. Of course, the knowledge from the US uh, is involved and components, right? So in the cameras, a lot of the, um, chips that are required to run uh, surveillance algorithms are only produced by American companies. Chinese, Chinese companies don't have the ability to, to produce those chips yet. Um, and so, so there's some American technology involved. Uh, and now, I mean, the Trump administration is starting to try to uh, limit that. Right, the entity list will have an impact on that. We'll, we'll, well, we'll see. We'll see how big an impact, yeah. But, yeah. Uh, but yeah. 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 So building kind of on how does this technology have broader impacts beyond Xinjiang and even beyond China, you wrote a piece about Uganda and that Huawei had sold some technology right. to the Ugandan government and also was servicing that technology in certain ways. So can you talk a little bit more about what you found and what you think it means? Right. So, um, so earlier this year, some, some colleagues of, of mine in Africa um, were, I mean, the, the genesis of this, of this story was, um, was that we knew that China obviously had a huge presence in Africa, and we knew that Huawei uh, had a large presence in Africa. And so we just we were just kind of curious what they were doing, because Huawei has been making this push to get into surveillance. It hasn't traditionally been one of its businesses, but it's, it's, it sees the growth opportunities there. And so, so we were just kind of curious, what, like, what, what are they doing in Africa? Um, and, and so my colleagues, Kind of poking around, and they stumbled on to. I mean, well, they they dug up uh, this amazing story about Huawei um, in Uganda and, and other places, but primarily we were concentrating on Uganda. Uh, that Huawei basically had sold um, was selling what they call safe city systems, um, which are uh, you know they're essentially. It's urban pre surveillance. Predictive policing and all that. There's jazz, a little bit yeah. of, I mean, it's not quite clear how much predictive policing there is, um, but there's, a, there's definitely a lot of video surveillance, and you know, it's, it's basically what, what Chinese police are doing, right? Um, and so Huawei had sold the system in Uganda, uh, and the, there were a couple interesting things about it. One of them was that uh, we found out that um, Huawei employees were, had were working sort of were like stationed inside the Ugandan police department and been helping, uh, had actually helped hack into the WhatsApp uh, account of the main opposition politician. Was this guy named he was a musician named Bobby Wine, who was sort of who's, who's really frightened the current regime, the uh, Museveni regime in Uganda, because he's because he's got all the young people behind him, and so they. The Huawei technicians actually, you know, the, the Ugandan police couldn't figure out. They, they bought some, some spyware from Israel and couldn't figure out how to use it. And the Huawei technicians were like, oh, yeah, give, us, give it to us and let us see what we can do. And two days later, they had cracked his, his WhatsApp and were able to sort of uh, break up this concert that he was going to hold. Um, uh, and then in addition to that, was, what was also interesting, I think probably maybe more interesting for the topic of the context of this discussion, is that the... Um, the, through the entire process, the uh, the Chinese embassy was involved, right, in sort of helping set up and helping make the sales pitch. And so, a, a senior official from the the Chinese embassy in Uganda uh, met with the chief of police, took a delegation of Ugandan police to Beijing, where they went to the Ministry of Public Security's building on near Tiananmen Square and did a whole and they got a whole presentation on how the Chinese police use surveillance systems. Um, and then they, then they went down to, he, he then took them down to Shenzhen, to Huawei's headquarters, where they got the pitch there. And then afterwards, after the, the sale had been completed, uh, they brought uh, Chinese police, a delegation of Chinese police, to Uganda, to Kampala, to conduct training there. Uh, and so the Chinese government was sort of involved quite intimately throughout, this, throughout the process. And so that sort of, in some ways, maybe you've answered this indirectly, but right. I mean, there are these sort of allegations in Washington that China's both exporting its sort of valence technology, but also sort of the governance structure that goes with that. Do you think right. that there's validity in that statement? Um, I think, I mean, I think the evidence suggests that they are, I mean, I get, it depends on what you mean by governance structure, but I think the, what you can say is that the government is, the Chinese government is promoting this idea of internet sovereignty, right? This idea that, that 
the internet and, and internet connected, internet related technologies should be regulated by governments. And, and so that each state should have ultimate say over how it uses the internet and technology within its borders. Um, and, and then for those countries who want to use the technology in the same way that China's government uses it, they are happy to train them on how to do it. Um, and, and I think you know, there's also maybe an argument to be made that these sorts of technology, you know, these technologies kind of lend themselves to a kind of, uh, a, you know, state surveillance, right? It's like, um, you know, if you give police facial recognition, they're going to use it. It's hard right? to resist. Right. Yes. So, um, and any government, I think, will be tempted to do that. And the United States, obviously, after 9-11 uh, with the Patriot Act, uh, showed that it is also willing to do that sort of, that sort of thing. So, so. So I think that, the, you know, the, I don't know, it's hard to argue now that they're actively pushing their model on everyone, but they are sort of creating the conditions for it to, to flourish. For uptake, okay. Yeah. yeah, well, thank you. Jude, I'm gonna hand it back to you. Yeah, so, Kate, I wanted to um, ask you about some of the reporting you've been doing recently. Um, so you've been, you know, you've reported from, from China, Hong Kong, and, and now watching um, this issue closely from here. One of the things that comes out in your reporting, you've been following very closely this um, overall shift in the political discussion here in the United States on China. And there seems there's certain kind of wedge issues which are accelerating actions by uh, the United States, but in, especially at, at commerce. Um, um, and you know, we've got UST, uh, excuse me, we've got CFIUS, we've got all these sort of issues. And one of the interesting things is how um, events in Xinjiang have propelled forward a lot of US actions. And, you know, you'd recently done a piece on the, what was that, three weeks ago now, the uh, uh, additional entities list, uh, or the additions to the entity list of, of 28 or 30 uh, Chinese entities, government, as well as private sector uh, companies for their involvement in Xinjiang. Let's ask you just to contextualize what's happening here and, and how did suddenly this issue of Xinjiang start to make its way onto um, re regula regulatory as well as sort of legislative agendas? Yeah, no, it's, um, it's really interesting that that's where we saw the policy go, because if you look at the comments that President Trump has made, um, I don't think that um, human rights is really at the top of his list of personal priorities. Um, but at the same time, he has empowered a sort of interesting mix of people in his, his administration um, that have enabled uh, some of these actions regarding Xinjiang, right? So you've got a lot of national security hawks who maybe wouldn't have had as much of a voice previously. And then you have a lot of these religious freedom advocates. And I think the combination of those um, types of people that have been empowered in this administration, um, along with a lot of bipartisan demand in Congress that action be taken on Xinjiang, is what sort of coalesced um, and led to this entity listing action that you mentioned. Um, and so you guys, I'm sure you guys all know um, that that entity listing means that all those Chinese companies and, and, and entities cannot get US origin technology anymore unless there's actually a license granted for it. Um, and so it certainly sends a really strong message symbolically. I mean, it's a really strong statement in that sense. Um, but there's definitely been a lot of question over how much impact it's actually going to have in practice um, due to a variety of reasons. Uh, one of the reasons is that because people had been complaining about this issue in Xinjiang for so long, um, and there had been threats that these companies would be added to the entity list, or there would be treasury sanctions or some other type of action, um, and because the US had previously already trotted out the entity list tactic on ZTE and Huawei, a lot of these Chinese companies who are active in Xinjiang you know, they saw the writing on the wall and they were already stockpiling a lot of the critical technologies that they needed um, that have US links. Uh, so this, this action would have been a lot more effective if it, if it had been a sort of surprise move, but it, it wasn't. Um, the other issue is just the nature of the global supply chain. Um, I mean, yes, um, you know, these Chinese companies are using US components, but there's also other, um, you know, companies that they can source a lot of these materials from. Um, and so the US isn't the only game in town for, for a lot of this stuff. Um, and then, as we've seen with Huawei, there are also US companies who are able to continue supplying 
a lot of uh, Chinese companies on the entity list anyway um, if they're producing those goods offshore or whatever. So, I mean, it's definitely, um, I think that you know, national security hawks and uh, religious freedom advocates are happy to send this message. Um, and it was remarkable, but again, there's sort of limits to how much each of these uh, government tools can achieve. And I think a lot of people are still trying to figure that out and, and come up with the right mix uh, to actually achieve what they want. Um, so you're saying global supply chains are complicated. <laughs> yeah. Um, you, know, another, you guys are probably glad you all came out here to hear that uh, pearl of wisdom. <laughs> and, you know, another, uh, another wedge issue or another accelerant issue um, has been this idea of military civil fusion, which is um, not unique. So this is not unique to Xi Jinping. This, this dates back a while in China, but certainly like a lot of these issues which predate Xi Jinping, but nonetheless Xi Jinping has really cranked up the volume uh, to, to 11 uh, on it. Um, you had done a piece recently uh, after uh, this great report by C4ADS came out um, uh, on, on military civil fusion. I wonder if you can talk a little bit about, um, and again, this is at this core issue of, of how China is utilizing sort of a, uh, gathering, assimilating, and then utilizing uh, technologies for some of its larger military strategic and governance purposes. I wonder if you can kind of first just give us the dummies version uh, of, of, of kind of what's going on here. And then you, you, there's a really interesting case in the report and also in your reporting on this um, just wonderfully named Be Beijing Highlander uh, digital technology. Anyone who's a Sean Connery fan knows that the Highlander is one of his, his best movies. Um, if you could just talk about um, that, that case of Beijing Highlander just so we can kind of understand what military civil fusion looks like and why it's a concern to the US. Yeah. Um, I really do think, I, I do wish US policymakers would come up with a new phrasing to describe military civil fusion, because I think like when you hear that, your eyes just sort of glaze over and you just don't really want to delve in. Is that a brand, branding problem? <laughs> yeah, I think there's a branding problem there. Um, but I mean, in its most basic form, it's just you know China's trying to upgrade their military, and they're trying to use the combined resources of state-owned firms and research institutes and uh, so-called private uh, sector firms in China, right? So um, a lot of people, when they hear about that, their sort of immediate reaction is like, well, that sounds like what we have here in the US with the military industrial complex. Um, and you know, for this article that we uh, wrote, we did talk to some US officials about that. And one of the top State Department officials sort of said, look, um, no, <laughs> it's totally different because like in the US, yes, we have military contractors, but we don't force them to work with us, right? They can pursue their own commercial uh, strategies, right? And then if, if what they're doing makes sense with what we're doing, then we have a deal. Whereas this, this issue in China um, is that, I guess, the government's sort of telling these um, private sector firms, hey, you're going to help us build military. And so it's a different, different thing. Um, and the other point, Jude, I think you rightly pointed out this, this concept of blending um, you know, state and civilian technology in China to, to improve the military has been around for a while, for sure. But the reason, there are several reasons why I think right now it's of greater concern to the US strategically. Um, one of which is just the fact that a lot of Chinese companies are a lot more active now in the international uh, sphere. Right, and so they're able to do a bunch more business deals with like US, European, Canadian, whatever companies. Um, and these companies, in some cases, might not even realize that you know, they may be helping build China's military because they might think that they're working with just like a private firm in China. Um, I think there's certainly a lot of companies who very well know who they're working with, um, but you know, it's a case by case basis. Um, and the other issue is just the nature of um, technology, you know, dual use technology these, these days, right? So now you're just seeing a lot more um, uh, civilian technology that has ready applications for the military, right? So, you know, obviously AI, drones, this kind of stuff, um, which tons of people are, you know, it's not just about tanks and cannons and, and that type of thing anymore. It's about like what you would in most contexts consider consumer technology. Right, and then that is a military application. Can you talk about the Highlander? The, oh, yes. The, the company, not the movie. I will. Um, I will not talk about the movie. I don't think I've seen that, um, but I'll add that to the list. Um, 
So Beijing Highlander is a good example of how this works in practice. Um, and C4, C4 ADS uh, did a great job of um, you know, illuminating this as a case study in their report. And then we did some you know, additional reporting on it as well. And basically, this was a company that was um, presenting itself on you know, English, their English language website as just like you know, a Chinese firm who's just out there in the world doing business for itself. Uh, but then when you look on the Chinese language version of the same website, you see them brag about how they're helping the military, they've got all these awards from the government, you know, they, they very much firmly present themselves as actively participating in this military civil fusion strategy. Um, but for about 15 years, they were going around the world, um, around Europe, Canada, doing a bunch of deals with companies and uh, then they ended up using a lot of that technology to um, help China's military, including um, helping build its first aircraft carrier. <laughs> so it's not like small deals we're talking about. Um, but they finally sort of hit a snag um, when they uh, took over this Canadian company that happened to have the US Navy as one of its customers. Um, and recently, uh, the executive of that uh, Canadian company and the company itself ended up pleading guilty uh, to federal charges of um, wrongly you know, transferring uh, US Navy data to the Chinese. Just thinking that the example you just said about the, the difference between the English and, and Chinese website, John Pomfret has a great line in a piece that for the Chinese government, the first level of encryption is just putting something into Chinese. Um, you know, fi final, final case I wanted to, which you'd done a really extensive piece of reporting on, was this, this case of uh, uh, advanced micro devices, a AMD. Um, so I wonder if you could talk about that case in particular, because that also talks about uh, the, the, uh, uh, the difficulty, for, I think, for external observers of, uh, and even some of these companies, of, of navigating deals with Chinese companies and for government regulators looking at the difficulties of assessing these, especially when you have an interlocking web of, of, of JVs. Uh, so can you talk about that, that case a little bit? Yeah, definitely. So as, as you all know, probably AMD is you know, one of the US's top chip makers. Um, they and Intel are the only two chip makers in the world that are making the you know, state of the art um, x86 chip, which is really a foundational technology. Um, and a few years ago, AMD was really on the rocks financially, and they made a deal with a Chinese military contractor to help them build x86 chips. Um, and now, uh, a bunch of experts that we've interviewed for this piece believe that China is using the resulting chips from that joint venture in what is believed to be the world's fastest supercomputer. Um, China hasn't actually submitted that computer uh, for any tests yet. It's sort of like in stealth mode. Um, but some of these, these uh, um, high performance computing experts who, who travel around China claim to have seen this, this beast. Um, and so you know, this deal ended up really saving AMD from uh, what some analysts believe was imminent bankruptcy. Uh, but at the same time, now we're seeing you know, a very, very coveted technology um, emerge in something that uh, could potentially be very dangerous uh, for U.S. national interests, um, which is China um, taking a lead in supercomputing, potentially. Uh, and these computers have all sorts of military applications. Mm. Um, and I think like, at the crux of this issue was the, the way that this deal was structured. And actually, this, this deal was sort of one of the key reasons that lawmakers wanted to reform the Committee on Foreign Investment in the US process, the CFIUS process, right? They saw this deal and others like it going through, and they weren't being reviewed by this US National Security Review Panel um, because they just fell between the cracks, right? They weren't clear um, you know, foreign acquisitions of US assets. They were these weird JV structures. And this one in particular was pretty ingenious because it was actually two different JVs that were like interlocked. Um, and so AMD was able to say throughout that they never lost control of their IP because they were in charge of the JV that was managing that. But the, the China controlled JV, which was interlocked with the US controlled one, was able to say, well, this is indigenously made Chinese technology. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, you know, CFIUS never ended up reviewing this deal, really. I mean, the, the 
The Defense Department really wanted them to. Um, Treasury rejected that. You know, defense ended up, you know, pushing this through to try to get it reviewed anyway. But, you know, at the end of the day, um, it was just something that fell through the cracks. And and there's, there's, I'm told, like thousands of other examples like that. Yeah. Yeah, and obviously, you know, CFIUS is uh, overworked and understaffed to deal with one of these, and it's also, I feel like the issues that the three of you raised today are just why this, this issue of kind of what we're calling now decoupling isn't going away anytime soon because folks are trying to figure out how do you, how do you stay integrated and yet protect national security. I think both China and the U.S. don't have good answers for for this yet, which is why we're seeing a lot of sledgehammers rather than rather than scalpels. Um, I just seen you scribbling a bunch. Was there any? Comments you wanted to throw in, um, or were you just scribbling? I'm just trying to scribbling. Sure, okay. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I was taking notes on some things smart people said. <laughs> um, okay. Well, great. That, that's actually perfect timing because we've got um, a, a half hour, um, and, and again, to, to make sure we can get as many sort of comments and questions in as possible. Just uh, appreciate concision, uh, and, and we'll raise your hand and, and we'll come around with Mike Ron. You first, sir, and then I'll come to you, sir. Thank you so much, uh, Mike. My, my, I'm really grateful for all, all the wonderful reporting Wall Street Journal's done. And my apologies if I miss it, but I don't believe you mentioned uh, your colleague's name, uh, the, uh, Chun Han Wong, who in just in oh, August right. was denied a visa to, to China. I, I know he has a specific report in this sector, but Josh made the great comments about technology, and it's not so much whether or not it works, but sort of the perception. And so I'm curious, you know, whether or not the refusal of a visa to, to Mr. Wong has impacted your uh, reporting. Uh, and it doesn't seem like there's been that many public comments regarding, I mean, there were some statements, but there hasn't, it doesn't seem to have been much action, so it'd be great if you could comment on that. Uh, well, it's a little bit above my, my pay grade. Uh, and I'm, I'm not, I wasn't actually privy to any of the discussions um, that took place around Chun Han's situation, because uh, I've, been, I've been on book leave. Uh, I, wasn't, I wasn't around when he left, so I, haven't, I actually haven't had a chance to talk to him about it. But um, it, hasn't, uh, it hasn't really affected, as far as I know, the, the, the way the journal approaches China. Um, Chun Han has been, he's in Hong Kong now, and he's doing really great coverage there. So, um, uh, and, and so it really hasn't, and I think his plan was be, to be doing that sort of coverage anyway already, so at least in the short term. <laughs> Uh, it hasn't affected his coverage. Um, I mean, I think in general, the Chinese government has been um, trying to put pressure across the board on foreign media in a way that it hasn't in the past, uh, and in multiple ways. Uh, and I think that this is, this is just a sign. It's the first time it's ever happened to the journal. That's uh, a pretty rare thing uh, in general for, a, for a, a, uh, an accredited foreign correspondent to have their visa not renewed this way, which is effectively an, an expulsion. Um, but um, but I, mean, I think we'll probably expect to see possibly more of this sort of thing, and not just for the journal, but for, for news organizations generally in China. Yeah, and just to add, I mean, it's definitely above our pay grade as uh, reporters at the institution, but the journal did cover the story of, of Chin Han's expulsion, and that article that was published in our outlet did include quotes from you know, the most senior people at the newspaper um, condemning that action. Sir, uh, right here in the front. Either mic is fine. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm Do Jun Zhang from Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. I have a question about harnessing AI technology to military in China. Compared to the U.S., I think China doesn't have enough war, real world experience to demonstrate the predictability of AI system in military. Because the one of the problem, one of the problematic uh, problem caused by the AI is maybe the deep learning systems can have some unpredictable results. So how China military can deal with it without some uh, practical experience, or how the Chinese company can uh, deal with that kind of problem. Any, any AI experts up here who are? Um, well, I, mean, I, did, I did a story uh, last year about, uh, about uh, China's use of AI and other advanced technologies in the military sphere. So I mean, I think that that's a good question. I mean, obviously, the US, this is, this is uh, an interesting situation in that it's, it's the reverse of, of the civilian use of AI situation in which uh, for, for civilian AI, China is, is um, at least with surveillance and those sorts of technologies, China is way ahead of the U.S. In, in terms of experience because it's willing to 
put this stuff on the streets. And so it's able to train its algorithms on, on real life situations in ways that you know the US uh, can't as easily. Um, but I think you're right. I think in the, in the military context, the US obviously has several, is involved in several conflicts and has been for a while and has been able to test its systems in those real world situations in China. China hasn't. I mean, China does a lot of, um, I mean, partly for that reason, just operationally, where China gets involved in a lot of uh, UN peacekeeping missions and that sort of thing. I don't think we know to what extent they are trying to use that sort of uh, operation to test their, their capabilities. Um, I mean, there's a lot of sort of virtual testing and that sort of thing. I mean, there's just, there's just so much secrecy around what any military, but especially the Chinese military is doing. I think it's hard to say, but that, that is a good point. I mean, I think it is one area that they, that they probably, or the US does have an advantage. Um, the, 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 the one thing, I think, if you talk to US military folks, they would say that China's the, China has an advantage in that it's more willing to, um, to uh, experiment with types of AI that, that would make the US military dangerous, especially in terms of sort of eliminating human decision making entirely. Uh, but, but that's controversial, and if you, I mean, there are Chinese military people who, do, who deny that. So, uh, but this is, I think it's just one area where we really have to kind of, we don't know as much as we probably, as we want to, and probably have to wait and see a little bit. Sir, you had your hand up next, in the blue shirt. Uh, thank you. I was wondering where the Chinese social credit system fits into their governance plans. That's a very concise question, so I appreciate it. <laughs> um, I can talk a little bit about the social credit system. I'll ask for you to sure. supplement. Um, so basically, I think we first began hearing about the social credit system around 2014. To the extent of my knowledge, and I don't know if this has changed last year, there wasn't like a single like proclamation right, like a law, like the cybersecurity law in 2016. Um, but basically what, what there is is a series of blacklists that are controlled by different entities and that are interlinked. So for example, um, Human Rights Watch has tracked people or heard from people who maybe have been a drug offender, have been a human rights lawyer, something that's gotten them flagged in the system, and have been unable to buy train tickets or plane tickets or tickets or uh, make certain hotel reservations because they've been um, you know, flagged in one part of the system and it's denied their ability to do something else. And I think that there, I think that this will expand. I do think there well, I should also say there are a couple examples. There's one city, I can't, yes, um, that had experimented with having an actual score. So I think you started at maybe a thousand points, and you could lose points if you don't pay bills on time, and maybe you gain points if you like help help grandma or something. Um, to the extent of my knowledge, that those have been local experiments. We haven't seen that scale up, but I think what I can say is, is that um, there is a desire at multiple levels of government to figure out how to score people and how to prohibit people from doing certain things. And so the final form of that, we don't know yet, um, but I think this is an example of where you know, again, toward the governance question, I mean, mu much of what Josh talked about and the problems of technology is really about fear-based technology surveillance. But, you know, the Chinese government intends, let's just say it intends to use technology in ways that aren't all awful. Um, and so, you know, figuring out, like, who's a fraudster, who's a bad landlord, right? Um, they, that, you know, I mean, when I lived in Beijing, uh, you know, I paid three months in advance. There's no credit check because there's no system to do that, right? I mean, and a lot of people will talk about, oh, their landlord kept their deposit or, you know, somebody lived in a place and then scooted out, you know, on the bill, this kind of thing. So the, the desire to um, collect information to help people make financial decisions, there, there is a logic to it that's not horrible, uh, but the application of it 
we're just sort of seeing different experiments, and it, it may be horrible in the end, it may not be horrible, I'm not sure. Um, but that is something that is going on at the same time and is not um, you know, fully formed yet, I guess is what I would know. Please update me. No, I think that's basically right. I think the, so. The so the blacklist. I think the interesting, the important thing to note about the social credit system as it exists now, um, as Christine said, it's very much kind of embryonic. Uh, and so the blacklists are these are systems that are based in the legal system, right? So if you have a um, some sort of administrative penalty or civil penal penalty, you know that a court has imposed on you, then you can end up on one of several blacklists and be punished for multiple things, right? So if you, if there's a civil judgment, you lose a civil suit and you owe someone, you know, $10,000 and you don't pay that money, then you end up on a blacklist and you can't buy train tickets or plane tickets and, and whatnot. Um, but it's very much rooted in the, in the legal system. So even like the cases where like a, a, a human rights lawyer ends up on these blacklists, I mean, it's trumped up. Right, but like I, um, I'm at, but there's, there's one one example in particular I think that people tend to refer to. And this is a, this was a guy who local officials just made up some sort of basically made up a charge uh, that he was convicted of, and that's what got him on the blacklist. So they're not it's not it's not Black Mirror yet, right? It's not that like everyone's walking around and being judged constantly by this like data hoovering network and, and then being punished. Um, and there's there's quite a bit of debate about whether I mean, I, personally, I think if you read the, the Chinese government's, the Communist Party's documents, they, they would love to get there. Um, and why not, right? It's a great system of, of sort of, of nudging and controlling society that doesn't require you to like crack people in the head with truncheons. But, um, but uh, there's a lot of questions about whether they can actually do that. And I think that includes the sort of local bureaucracies, mm -hmm. right? They, they don't want to give up power. They don't want to give up data. So they kind of like local officials tend to hoard all of the data that they, that they collect. And, um, uh, and that's just one example uh, of, of the barriers to implementing a system like that. But just if I can add on one thing, one of the questions that you, I mean, just to extend something that you were saying about the, the judgment that was made up. You know, I mean, we probably all have had issues where, like, I don't know, so a case of mistaken identity and, you know, like, how do you, how do you get yourself off a list that it shouldn't be on? Right. That's something there's just not transparency about. Whether it's intentional in this case, it's like, you know, trumped up charge or accidental, right? Like, that wasn't me on that scanner. That was someone with my name or someone who looked like me or my twin sister. So there are all these questions that we don't have transparency about how those bugs would be worked out. Um, and just one last super quick point on that. I think the social credit system is also uh, an arena where we're seeing um, you know, potential cooperation between the government actors and the private sector players, right? right. Because they often, it's the you know, so-called private sector that's getting so much data and then how they're going to interact with the government players is kind of still being figured out. Um, we had done some reporting a while back where Equifax here um, in the US had reported to the FBI concerns that uh, some of their employees had actually taken some of their um, proprietary um, like credit rating algorithms over to Ant Financial, um, which at the time was um, you know, working on their own. Which is Alibaba's, which is an Alibaba com company, correct? Um, well, it's a, an affiliate, I guess. Yeah. I mean, it's the same. Uh, you know, Jack Ma is controlling both of them, but they're like separate, I guess. Um, but yeah, so so, and I think that's I think that's still being worked out. And I think a lot of the private sector firms in China would like want to get a piece of certain aspects of this, but they also have their own rivalries. So it's 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 pretty messy. But it's it seems a little bit um, analogous to the military civil fusion situation. Um, so I just wanted to point that out. Sir, right here. I feel like I could just speak at full volume. Well, it's for, we've, we've, we've got cameras on, so it's for the Right, exactly, person. exactly. Um, Mario Colot Sais, one question I wanted to ask was, what do you notice of the effects of these Xinjiang policies among your friends and contacts in Chinese society? And within sort of the wider sphere of Chinese society, how are these news reports, how are these stories impacting the people you know? Um, I mean, I, I'll speak very briefly because I'm sure you have more to add to that. Um, so I had done um, a couple environmental reporting trips to Xinjiang in 2011 and 2013. 
and I had made some Uyghur friends in Beijing who, for other reasons, had since sort moved of back. So one of the things that, um, uh, with the with the black with the with the collection of data, one of the things I think this comes from Human Rights Watch that can flag someone as a potential high risk individual in Xinjiang is whether or not they have um, contact or receive messages from foreigners or from relatives living outside Xinjiang. So with great sadness I've realized I can't contact any of these friends because it would be a great risk to them. Um, among Han Chinese friends, there's a bit what Josh described earlier with his colleagues. It all seems so much that you almost can't believe it's real. And so I have had some discussions where people say, oh, come on, can this really be real? And it's not even always people who are reactively pro-CCP. Um, so some people are incredulous. Some people, especially, I mean, you know, people who've worked with foreign Chinese citizens who work with or for foreign media have accepted it as true, but find it really difficult to talk about because what, what can they do? What can change from them speaking about it? Um, so those are some of the reactions that I've been aware of. Yeah, I think that, that sounds about right. I mean, in terms of the Chinese reaction, I, well, I mean, first, there isn't, there isn't a huge amount of information inside China about what's going on for most people, right? I mean, the, even though, you know, VPNs are relatively uh, available in China, a very small number of people actually use them. And, and that these days, you kind of have to, to get a VPN that works in China, you actually have to pay money. And, and so very, not, not very many Chinese people, as a percentage, pop over the firewall to see what's going on. Um, I think and even amongst those who do, there, I mean, there's quite a bit of Islamophobia in China. Um, and, and it's, you know, it's really hard to say how much of that is, you know, the result of party propaganda and how much of that is just sort of naturally occurring. I mean, there's lots of Islamophobia everywhere, right? Uh, but, but I think that sort of <coughs> uh, serves as a, a kind of psychological barrier uh, to, to people really, those who do hear about what's happening. Uh, to them sort of accepting that as true or as real. I think they just sort of assume that, that leaders are making all of this stuff up. Um, and uh, yeah, so I mean, I think, I mean, it, it is interesting. I had one example where I, where I was speaking to some Chinese students in Beijing who, who were all uh, studying abroad and had come back for the summer. And it was like a summer program. And um, when I was invited to come in and speak, and I spoke about Xinjiang and and, uh, and the the group there were there were certain there was a sort of small group of people who who sort of seemed to, to basically believe um, what they had seen. I showed video from Xinjiang, so and, um, and, you know, they sort of seemed to accept it. And there was another small group uh, sitting on the other side of the room that were sort of accusing me of bias and and, and all sorts of things that sort of didn't accept it. And then I heard later from from the Professor, this was like a discussion that went on throughout the summer, um, and that kind of, but slowly over time, uh, the professor claimed that like the, the majority of the students, you know, initially they were they were very skeptical, and then sort of towards the end they sort of accepted that maybe something was happening in Xinjiang that was not 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 great. Um, so I think you know, there's room for people to be convinced on this, but it's but it's in like this kind of a, it's in like it's in a, an environment like that, a small group of people discussing it, kind of. Um, so yeah. Great. Other, other, other questions? Yes, right here in the front. Thank you. Uh, Katie Wang with NTD TV. Uh, my question is, um, we know uh, CCP has been tightly controlled uh, Xinjiang and uh, using all the surveillance and uh, collecting the personal information, DNA, and so on. So I'm just wondering, is this model, um, do you see this model is being um, expanded to other parts of the country? Or even like uh, Hong Kong, people are also concerned that maybe in the future, China will um, have more surveillance on Hong Kong as well. Um, I don't think that there's, uh, we haven't seen any evidence of, the, of them doing Xinjiang levels of, of surveillance anywhere else. So they've, um, you know, in, 
other parts of China, there, there are large Muslim populations. Uh, they're Hui Muslim, so they're distinct from Uyghurs. Um, they, are, they don't have a separatist movement, right? So they're, they're considered a little bit less of a threat by the, by the party. Uh, but there is nevertheless a crackdown on religion in those areas. Uh, and so everyone has been looking, watching very closely to see whether or not uh, sort of Xinjiang levels of surveillance are implemented in these areas. And the, the results are sort of yes and no. And like there's, there's surveillance on the mosques, for example, that you see in Xinjiang, but you're not, but you don't have the sort of same level of, uh, you don't have camps, uh, and you don't have the same levels of like street surveillance and and big data analysis of threats and, and that sort of thing. Um, so yeah, so I, I think you know Xinjiang is a unique situation in some ways, um, in, in, in that it's you know, it's a long history of, of separatism there. Uh, the party has has never really been able to figure out a solution, um, and and has always been willing to take much more. Uh, extreme steps there than they have anywhere else. Um, uh, that said, I mean, you know, the Xinjiang is a, you know, it is a laboratory. It is where they get to test out a lot of these technologies. And, and you certainly are starting to see, like I said earlier, in, in Beijing and Shanghai, uh, other cities, you're starting to see this technology appear. And that technology has been tested in Xinjiang. Um, and there are reports that Hong Kong, Hong Kong police do have access to facial recognition technology. I don't think it's actually, I can't remember the company that I don't think I don't know if it was a Chinese company or not, um, but but I mean obviously the you know the, the party is very concerned about what's happening in, in Hong Kong, uh, and they they've said recently that they want to you know uh, increase their cooperation with the Hong Kong police. So so I think it you know it wouldn't be surprising if, if, if those sorts of similar types of systems started to appear in Hong Kong, but but we don't know. Okay, Christina, do you have anything? Oh, I was just going to say, I mean, just about Hong Kong, um, one of the things that protesters have targeted have been towers that they believe have cameras that have facial recognition. So certainly um, physical signs of technology or apparent technology are one of the things people are associating with with the worst of repression in China and, and targeting and lashing out against. I think that's really interesting. And also all of the, um, all the debates about face masks, right? Because if there is technology, you're going to be much more difficult to be recognized if you obscure parts of your face. And so the desire to be able to wear masks is something that people at Hong Kong have really um, made a key issue. So again, whether or not the Chinese government in Beijing intends to roll things out in Hong Kong, you're seeing people mobilize around some of these questions. Um, just because we only have 10 minutes left, I just maybe I'll collect the final grouping of questions, and then we'll sort of wrap it up. So sir, I saw you uh, in the center. I think I saw you in the back second, and then over there. Yes, you. Uh, so we'll go in that order. Over the past two years, uh, the media has probably been the, the primary uh, source for informing uh, companies about this mass surveillance police state that Western technology has enabled. What have you seen as the response from companies uh, beginning to distance themselves before we get to action from Treasury that would actually sanction the, the companies so that you have to distance yourself and China has to choose between international trade or a mass surveillance police state? Great. Good question. Um, thank you. I'm Zhang Qi with China's Taishi Media. Uh, my question is about, um, I think in the early ages, the US government helped some of the carding technologies to, in the way that um, it made contracts and help eventually commercializing some technologies, say like chips. So this kind of, I'm wondering how does this, is different from the current, uh, what's going on with China about civil military uh, integration, because obviously like the US military used the, the technology in the military as well. So I wonder if panelists can talk more about that. Thanks. Great. And then finally over the corner. Uh, what do you see as possible ramifications of China gaining access to data from citizens of, say, African or other Asian countries? Um, via technology that China is exporting to those countries. 
Great. Three, three, three good questions. Um, um, happy to take them, whatever. You, you want to, the, the first one seems like a, a sort of react, you guys on just sort of reaction that you guys have been hearing from uh, um, companies as they've been reading the media reports that you've been doing and either uh, on their own uh, going to disentangle themselves from some of these supply chains. And Amy, actually, Amy, if you don't mind, I may draw you in as well because you're thinking a lot about this issue too and doing a, a lot of work on this. But any um, reactions that you're hearing from companies and strategies as they try to disentangle before they get slammed by the U.S. government? A anyone want to take a stab at first? I mean, you go first. Yeah, I mean, it, so there's, there's so many issues right now with um, just landmines everywhere right now, I think, for... Um, foreign companies that w want to do business in China and even beyond people who are, you know, involved in the technology supply chains. I think more than anything, what has sort of crystallized how little these um, foreign entities have thought through what their response should be, more than anything, I think, was the NBA controversy, right? I mean, no one had a clue of um, how to respond to that. Um, and I think it it finally sort of um, brought home to people here um, the, the risks of China sort of exporting its censorship beyond its borders. Um, in terms of the actual technology companies, I mean, all I've really seen from them is um, uh, spending, they're spending a lot of money on lawyers and lobbyists, and they're figuring out how to get around export controls and CFIUS. And they figured it out pretty quickly. Uh, so you know, ZTE, I think, when those, um, when they were first put on the entity list, it was like this company is going to die. You know, like they're shut down. By the time they tried the same playbook out on Huawei, people had already hired the right lawyers, and they know now how they can continue selling a huge amount of their products to Huawei as if nothing had happened. Um, so that's kind of the response <laughs> I'm seeing is sort of. Confusion on what the, the sort of PR response should be, which is what we sort of saw with the NBA. Um, and then with the tech companies, I'm seeing just very pragmatic um, efforts to continue their business uninterrupted. Yeah, I, 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 actually, I was just, that's, that's all I've seen. I was going to say they've spent money on, on PR people as well. And, and I think what you've mostly seen is they've gotten savvier about pulling down incriminating web pages and that sort of thing. That, that tie them to, to surveillance in China. But I don't, in terms of their behavior and their business models, I haven't, I haven't seen this, any changes at all. Amy, I'll, you, any I'll be thoughts? really quick. Um, and I'm not going to talk about a specific situation, but just note that there are international frameworks that at least the larger US technology companies have signed up for that basically, so supposedly they've committed to conducting human rights due diligence on like new products, new partnerships, country entry, et cetera where you'd be looking for these problems proactively. And they've managed to do it in other areas. So I think like this actually isn't rocket science. It's just a question of having the willpower to do it and then to actually make mature decisions based on ethical frameworks. You seen any, any, anything to add on that? I'm not forcing you to. Just... <laughs> OK, well, why don't we just for the sake of time, because I want to get through the other two questions. So the second one, kind of what's the difference? We're all doing oh. it anyway. Oh, yeah, I can just sort of reiterate my yeah. point um, from before, which is that um, I think there are reasons to believe that um, China's military civil integration plan is distinct from the way that the US, uh, inter you know, US companies and the military here interacts, in that the US government isn't ordering companies to do any specific task for it. These companies are pitching to get business from the government, right? Whereas um, in China, uh, the state is, um, you know, it's a state-driven model. And so, you know, a company may very well want nothing to do with the military, but they don't have that choice. Whereas like, counterpoint, you know, Google Maven, <laughs> right? Um, and, you, and you can argue that that was a wrong decision uh, by Google to sort of um, not work with the US military, but that was their decision and they made it. So. Um, I think it's it's there's they're different uh, systems. A third question. I've just managed to write down the letter D. I'd imagine, <laughs> I'd imagine the question is more complicated she, than that. She asked about access um, of 
data of people outside China. Okay. I, th I think the question was specifically, assuming that as Chinese technology, surveillance technology spreads to other countries, there are some people who think that that's being sent back to China, basically, or there's ways of getting better databases in China that aren't just of Asian faces, for example. And does that matter? Why should we care if that is, in fact, true? Well, one example that there's already been controversy, of course, is DGI, which is the drone maker based in Shenzhen. They're the world's leading maker of commercial drones. I know the US, which is like if you go to a wedding and somebody has like their pretty you know, shot of them on the beach, they're probably using a DGI drone. Um, or, you know, I mean, they're just so common. Um, and I think the US military banned the use of DGI drones on its bases because they don't know what's going to happen to that data. Now, of course, I think DGI has put out statements several times saying, no, no, we don't hoover up all the data, even though we could. We don't do it. Um, so we don't know. But certainly, people are already worried about questions like that. I also think that with the, with the MBA example, I mean, there's already examples um, well, I mean, this is more tied to the social credit system. But basically, the social credit system, we think of it as applying to individuals. But it also applies, so such as it is, also applies to companies. And so things like airlines are being, um, you know, if they, if they list Taipei as a city in Taiwan and indicate Taiwan as a separate country than the PRC, um, they might lose points on uh, or become added to some blacklist that affects their ability to do business in China. So that's not so much about individual level data, but already I think we're seeing um, there's just not a, as, as clear a distinction between data in the US about US companies and US individuals and data about Chinese individuals, especially as we have more and more of these sort of international interactions or you know, companies that, of course, fly airplanes between cities in different countries. Um, I just wanted to add a quick point about genomic data. Um, I think mm. that's one of like, the biggest concerns these days. Um, and a lot of it's actually due to the US's own uh, failure to put any um, protections in place, actually, for <laughs> protecting our, our data in that respect. Um, and China has a great need to get a more diverse array of genomic data because um, otherwise, they're only studying Chinese people mainly. I mean, obviously, there's a tremendous amount of diversity within China. But you know, if they want to also have data from people of European ancestry or African ancestry or you know Latinos or whatever, they need to get that data elsewhere. Um, and I don't think there's been a lot of thought, particularly in the US, to what the ramifications of that may be. And I, I just don't even, it's scary because I don't even know what those could be, you know, but it's concerning that there's, you know, China has very um, strict protections in place on uh, protecting that kind of information from leaving the country. And so um, it just worries me whenever there's sort of a total imbalance. Um, so I think that's something that is going to be really important in the coming years. Yeah, I'll just real quick and then. Yeah, 15 seconds. OK. Uh, I mean, I think one, one interesting uh, issue, I mean, the, there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's definitely an espionage uh, aspect of this. So there's Grindr, the controversy over China, China's ownership of mm. Grindr. Who would have thought they'd ever heard that, the controversy over Grindr? Yeah, yeah, shocking. Um, but, yeah, but there is, there was, I mean, heard from the State Department that there was real concern when that happened, uh, that there are members of the State Department who are on Grindr, um, and that the Chinese government might be able to use that as as a sort of a kind of blackmail capacity. And I will say on the issue of, so there's a company in, in Zimbabwe, a Chinese company called Cloudwalk that does facial recognition and gate recognition and that sort of stuff that uh, struck a deal with Zimbabwe to build out a national facial database for their police force as a way to collect more dark skinned faces to improve their algorithms. But the interesting thing to end this on a, on a sort of somewhat different note is there's been huge pushback. Uh, so I stopped through Zimbabwe when I was in Africa uh, and talked to some some officials there, and they said that actually that once it got out that this is what Cloudwalk was maybe interested in doing, um, there was there was public controversy, and that project has not actually proceeded um, as, as the way that Cloudwalk thought it would. So, well, a perfect. It's twelve thirty on the dot. Um, I want to thank everyone. Um, I also want to thank our, our panelists. I think you see the just the level of granularity you get when you when you've got you know three of the best reporters. Um, 
I hope everyone, you know, AP is a public good, so we can read it for free. Wall Street Journal is not a public good, so I, I recommend you, sub you subscribe and shell over the $5,000 a subscription <laughs> costs to help uh, support this great work. So please uh, join me in thanking them.